Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so today, so I'm the founder and CEO of BitNation, the world's first virtual nation providing actual governance services. Um, essentially, it's a blockchain jurisdiction, which I will explain more in depth in a few slides. Um, but today, I have a specific topic to speak about, which is self-sovereignty in a digital world. Because everything we do is becoming increasingly more digital. Our romantic life, our work life, and the blockchain, of course, is taking that to extreme extents. You know, we can now title our lands online, we can do wills, wills on the blockchain, we can do um, birth certificates, we can do everything, basically. It basically replaces much of the need we've had over the last couple of thousands of years for centralized institutions. But how do we handle this without it, A, becoming dystopian and actually more centralized in some ways? And how do we retain our self-sovereignty amongst the increasing surveillance, both from governments, but also peer-to-peer -peer surveillance and pressure? Like, for instance, we have the Snowden revelations, uh, which we are all very familiar with, of course, but also the social credit system in China, which is turning out more and more dystopian. Um, and Western governments are not very far from it. Like, for instance, I mean, everyone shares information with everyone, right? So, for instance, if you have a date on match.com, let's say, and that date uh, downrates you, then it will be harder for you to, let's say, get a loan for a house, because all companies share this data between platforms. So even though the social credit system in China seems very dystopian and far away from what we have in the West, it's actually not very different when you look under the hood. So how can we live in this increasingly digital world while retaining sovereignty? So it's interesting to talk about the subject of governance in Greece, because Greece is kind of the cradle of what we perceive as modern governance, namely democracy. Demo nearly every nation state in the world now applies democracy in one form or another. And most people are okay with this. Like what Winston Churchill famously said, um, I think he said something along the lines of, democracy uh, is a terrible form of government, is the worst form of government apart from all the other ones. But I would actually beg to disagree with that statement profoundly. Why? Not because I think that it's not transparent enough, or it can be corrupted, or it's not representative enough, or not liquid enough, or what have you. I don't, I don't agree with it because I think it's morally wrong that simply because you're outnumbered, someone can strip away your personal rights and sovereignty over your decisions, your assets, your body, whatever. Let me give you a concrete example. So, let's say you're, you're in a room and one person rapes you. Or you're in a room where 10 person rapes you. Is it more morally okay to be raped by 10 people than by one person? Obviously not, right? No one in their right mind thinks that gang rape is morally okay. Why? Because it's never, under any circumstances, any, okay to strip away a person's sovereignty, the person's right to decide over themselves, their body, their time, everything, right? Yet, everyone endorses democracy, while the very foundation of democracy is that if you're outnumbered, it's morally okay to strip away your rights to decide over your own life. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? 
Nation states are currently the prevailing order in the world, but nation states are a very new concept, only about 400 years old, roughly, if we look at the Westphalian Agreement, and it's, extremely, it's, it's shifting extremely rapidly now. Um, so imagine if we could live in a world where everyone had full sovereignty in terms of choosing their own governance services and governance models, including what code of law you want to, like common law, civil law, Sharia law, whichever, what kind of decision-making mechanism you want. Uh, it could be, well, democracy, of course, it could be holacracy, theocracy, whichever. Um, what kind of economic model you want, capitalism, socialism, communism, anything. What if people could tailor-make their own governance model based on their needs their lifestyle, their personality, and if they could choose it uh, as easily that you choose, sorry, as easily as you choose, for instance, a cell phone provider or a social network uh, or um, anything like that, right? Uh, that world can exist and we are building it. So here is a uh, short video um, that explains it a little bit better. Before nations, before borders, there was the Pangaea supercontinent. Since then, the world has been divided by tectonic shifts, widening oceans and stifling politics. Nation states are crumbling under the weight of local and global challenges that they seem incapable of solving. Rather than embracing a borderless world and increasing personal freedoms, governments and multilateral organizations have overseen a surge in bureaucracy, protectionism and ever greater intrusions into our personal lives. To prevent a drift towards tyranny, we need drastic change. Pangaea is BitNation's decentralized jurisdiction platform. Using Pangaea, you can build voluntary nations, agree contracts, and resolve disputes with other citizens, and access the services you need. This is our vision of jurisdiction as a service, a global market for governance services. The Pangaea Arbitration Token, or PAT, is an Ethereum-based in-app token that powers the Pangaea platform. When you create a contract, complete a contract, or resolve a dispute on Pangaea, you receive non-tradable reputation tokens through Lucy, our AI bot. Accumulating reputation tokens earns you tradable PAT tokens. This ensures that you can't buy a good reputation or acquire it through popularity. But if you earn one, you will be rewarded. Imagine a world where people can freely choose which voluntary nations and jurisdictions they want to be part of. A world where voluntary nations offer a choice of services under their own laws and policies and compete for citizens in a free market that rewards good governance. You too can be part of the future of governance by joining the Pangaea token sale. Welcome to the Internet of Sovereignty. Welcome to Pangaea. I believe we are right now in a crucial time and age where the nation state is going away, whether we want it or not, because of global communication, global transportation, global trade, um, everything, right? It's becoming obsolete, both in global governance as much as in local governance, because the nation state is nor particularly local nor global. Um, but we can choose what we do with this future, we here in this room, our generation, if you like, yeah? in the next 50, 100 years, this is going to be defined, right? We can either choose more centralized models, like United Nations, for instance, something like that, like more, you know, one world government or like controlled by big enterprises, like let's say Facebook or Google, or we can create a world of millions of competing alternatives where everyone can shape their own governance model. So, I believe, obviously, as you might imagine, in the latter, right? So how do we do it, right? What, what does this mean 
practically? How do we practically build that future? So if you take the nation state down to its very core, I mean, nowadays, we're used to the nation state doing everything, from roads to schools to you name it. But if you take it down to its very essence, a government's primary role is basically to provide security and justice. That's their MVP, minimum viable product. If they can't provide that, they do not classify as a government. So in order to outcompete governments, to offer a free market for government service, we have to outcompete them at the core. So therefore, we're creating a blockchain jurisdiction called Pangea. So what exactly is a blockchain jurisdiction specifically? So it's three things. It's the ability to enter into agreement according to rules you agree upon, whether those are just rules set for specific contracts or a code of law that you have agreed upon, or either an existing one or one that you make, right? It's the ability to resolve disputes around those agreements you have voluntarily entered into. And it's the ability to enforce agreements, which is probably the greatest challenge, right? So let's look at the first part. How do you create an agreement? So normally, when you create an agreement, regardless what it is, you know, it can be an agreement about buying or selling a car. It can be a marriage agreement. It can be, you know, are we going to meet up today for lunch type of agreement. But every single agreement always starts as a conversation between two or more consenting individuals or groups. And therefore, a chat front end makes sense. And not only because of that, because it starts with a conversation, but also if you look at the statistics, people around the world, like, like if you look at China using WeChat or Brazil, WhatsApp or Russia, Telegram, etc., people are more and more moving to mobile chat platform as their go-to platform for making agreements, to make business, including governance business. So all the fastest growing markets are moving towards this modus operandi, and it makes perfect sense, actually. So in our uh, software, you can basically have an end-to-end -end encrypted chat with a person or a group of people where you can do <coughs> excuse me, smart contracts through the chat application, right? So you just go to the plus sign next to the little text box, you click on it, and then you see a list of, of dApps and smart contract commands coming up that you can just add into the conversation, and it executes of itself, meaning you need zero coding knowledge or experience to effectively do a smart contract that executes automatically. You need a sovereign identity. So in a nation state world, if you fail to comply with a contract, you are most likely to be penalized by the state through court or whatever, or maybe put in jail even, right? That's why I call the stick analogy. We use what I would like to call the carrot analogy. Um, basically, so this is how our reputation system works is when you enter into an agreement um, or when you resolve dispute attached to an agreement, um, then you get non-tradable reputation tokens. The reason they are non-tradable is because we don't want reputation to be able to be bought or sold or gained through popularity or attention. But when you do accumulate non-tradable reputation tokens, you get a financial incentive through the expat token which is obviously a tradable token, so there's a financial incentive involved in good contract compliance. So that's an enforcement mechanism, but more important than that, it's a pseudo-anonymous identity. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term pseudo-anonymous, so anonymous means that it's just a name and you don't know who the person you are dealing with, who it is, right? Pseudo-anonymous means that you can't attach the identity to a person's flesh body 
but you can see a repetition of acts that they have done successfully, right? So there is a trust mechanism. And this model works and is applied everywhere. You know, if you look at, for instance, eBay, Airbnb, Uber, everywhere. People don't normally ask to look for an eBay seller's passport copy, right? They just trust the online reputation system. And this is used by millions of people every single day. And then you need a sovereign technology. So I know this slide looks exceptionally boring, and it is. And I'm going to try to not go in too much into detail and geek out on it. But essentially, if you look under the hood of our jurisdiction, it's basically, it's not a blockchain. It's a communications protocol. So um, we're building it by technology built by the same people who have developed IPFS, Protocol Labs. It's kind of a part of it called Lib P2P, where basically the way we have built it is like nodes gossip information between each other, um, or that's the end state of it. So it's, it's sovereign in the sense that we don't necessarily rely on conventional internet, right? In areas with low internet access, or let's say if there's a government shutdown of internet, or uh, an outage because of a storm or an earthquake or something, it can still work. Um, second, it also means that we are blockchain agnostic. So right now, all contracts are executed on Ethereum. However, we are planning to integrate Bitcoin as well through the Rootstock protocol. And we can, in the future, integrate basically any chain we want to, like EOS or Tezos or whatever pans out to be the most viable, effective chains. So, um, our ultimate end goal in this is that every single individual who makes an agreement on Pangea should be able to choose what chain they want to use for that specific agreement, right? And that is resilience, to not be um, dependent on any single chain, to be modular like Lego. And also, we released our API uh, a couple of months ago uh, for our DAP engine, so now everyone can build their own governance applications on top of it, right? To either sell it or give it away for free, whatever people fancy. For instance, uh, one person is working on a basic income DAP, uh, I know another person is working on peer-to-peer -peer security. Uh, you could make like an app for, to do trash collection in your neighborhood or whatever, right? And it's a very simple API, and we're releasing a much simpler version of it in uh, December or January, where people, even without nearly any development knowledge, can easily build a DAP, their own governance DAP and offer it on a global market for governance services. So we are far from alone in doing this. I mean, this all sounds very utopian, I know, right? And this sounds like a fantasy of people who grew up with internet and whatever, but it's not the case. If you look at the number of people who live either, let's say, in the shadow of nation-state jurisdictions, or between nation-state jurisdictions. Just consider this for a fact. Okay, so there are approximately one billion people in the world who are on the move, according to high-ranking UN officials, on the move in search for a better life, including refugees, internally displaced people, digital nomads, etc., etc. People on the move, right? Uh, the World Bank estimates that by 2025, there's going to be one billion people working online between jurisdictions, like, for instance, a freelancer, a freelance designer in Pakistan offering a service to a company in Canada, let's say. We have over 4,000 special economic zones in the world who operate under their own jurisdiction. We have more and more autonomous communities. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a significant part of humanity and an extremely rapidly growing part of humanity. So I'm going to skip that slide because I only have 50 seconds left. Um, and 
So just to give you uh, a quick picture of where we're going, uh, where we are and where we're going with this. And so we have worked on this since 2014, uh, doing research, tests, technology development, pilots, etc. The technology is right now uh, on Android. You can download it on Google Play and on iOS, uh, sadly, still on test flight. Uh, so you have to go to the website, uh, bitnation.co, and ask for an invitation. And the desktop client is coming out soon. And um, yeah, we're working very hard on adding better UI UX, better functionalities. And I think if I come back here in a year from now, it will blow your mind. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Be sovereign. Questions, please. Are there any from the crowd? Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, speech, it was great. I uh, have a question. There will be this uh, dispute resolution mechanism, there will be people that will trust, but eventually there might be some participants in this kind of autonomous jurisdiction that might not be satisfied from the result. So they might be tempted, they might have uh, an interest to go before a national jurisdiction to seek an alternative uh, solution for this, for their uh, difference. And my question is how this will work? How, which will be the competent jurisdiction or uh, uh, how this person will be able to execute a national uh, decision that is based on the function of your system? Thank well, you. Well, I, I hope, I dearly hope everyone will I mean, my goal with this is not that everyone are on our jurisdiction or follow our rules or our convictions. My goal with this is that everyone creates their own reality, right? If they use our technology, that's awesome, but it's certainly not a requirement. Huh? And so this is the big difference, right? Nation states, by definitions, are not opt-in and opt-out huh? because you are randomly born in a certain geographical area, and then you are imposed by a bureaucratic entity, a certain set of governance services that you are forced to pay for, whether you want to or not. So we take the opposite stance, saying we are going to provide these services, and if you want to use them, uh, then, then it's up to you to participate. And if you don't want to, you know, all the better for you, right? So I think there's a fundamental difference there. I mean, I personally think um, we, are, we are currently seeing like an uptake in nationalism and stuff recently, right? With Brexit and a lot of uh, like, like nationalist leaders getting elected all over Europe as well. So but in my personal opinion, that is kind of the last screams of a dying beast, if you like. Yeah? But for people who like traditionalism, what I think people get confused about is, you know, people are pitted against each other saying, oh, well, there is the globalists, and they're often seen as kind of left liberals or for UN and global democracy and what have you, and then you have the nationalists or localists or what have you who are for traditional values and lo localizing things. But here's the thing, though. The nation state is nor local nor global. I mean... What nation state is actually local, right? I mean, I, I don't know Greece in specifically, so I won't talk about Greece, but okay, let's say, um, for instance, France, right? People uh, who are close to the German border in north of France, um, in, in northeast France, they, they are more similar to Germans than they are to someone who lives on the Spanish border in, in the northwest corner of France, right? Who are much more similar to Spanish people. And it used to be different languages, it still is. Uh, there are still regional languages that are well and alive, right? And, and food cultures and moral principles, re religious differences, everything, right? So the nation state is not local. Let me drive home that point. If something like BitNation 
was the kind of modus operandi of the world, it would mean that people could set up a nation for their very local neighborhood or their very local region that would be much more actually local than the nation state has the capacity to be. Sorry, I, I kind of wondered, you know, everywhere there. Did that kind of answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, okay. Thank you. We're running out of time, so. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.